A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew in the fifth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, You shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser accuser, while you are on your way to court with him. Or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. It was also said, oh, forgive me, I think I've already gone too far. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Let us pray. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts here together be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. A few months ago, I made the comment in a sermon that Jesus wasn't a Lutheran. And of course, that's true. He wasn't a Lutheran. Jesus was a Jew. And all of his teachings, including the ones contained in our gospel reading this morning, are rooted in the Jewish faith in which he was raised. However, in our gospel reading today, which is an excerpt from the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus comes as close to sounding like a Lutheran as he does anywhere in the Gospels. The Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' address to his followers about the Law of Moses, the Torah, which is the very centerpiece of the Jewish faith. And there is no more revered figure among Jews than Moses. He is the lawgiver. He is the one who handed down the Torah and the commandments. His voice carries more authority than any other figure in their faith. And the way Jesus goes about presenting these teachings is really quite provocative. He starts by quoting one of the commandments. You have heard it said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder. And then he follows that up by saying, but then I say to you, and you can imagine how religious people in his day and religious authorities received this. What he is claiming in essence is that his words carry greater authority than those of Moses. And that is straight up blasphemy. He proceeds then 
to add to and alter the law of Moses, the commandments, for his disciples. He raises the bar for his followers on what we are expected to do in trying to obey these commandments. You have heard it said to those in ancient times, you shall not murder. Now I take it for granted that everyone present here is free of, of guilt of ever having murdered anyone. Uh, I, I assume that no one here has actually ever murdered another human being. Now, you've probably been angry enough at times that you wanted to, but my assumption is that you've never acted on any of those feelings. And it's kind of ironic, before the service started today, Bob Schwartz came to me and we were talking about the storage capacity in our new mission control. And he made the comment, there's so much storage down there, we can bury all the bodies. I, I just thought I'd let you know that, he said, in, in case it's ever necessary. Well, my hope is that, that I never feel compelled to, to go that far. Um, but the truth is that as human beings, we all have strong and compelling feelings that are sometimes difficult to rein in. And Jesus, in teaching about the commandment not to murder, goes on to say, I tell you that you must not be angry with a brother or sister, or else you will be liable to judgment. So you can see how he's raised the bar here. It's one thing to ask us not to murder, quite another to ask us not to even be angry with a brother or sister. And how can we possibly reach a goal like that? We're human beings. We get angry. It's part of our makeup. We will never be able to reach that high bar that Jesus has set for us. But then he warned us last week in the Gospel reading that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So what is the hope here? Is Jesus the thought police? Is he trying to legislate our thoughts and our feelings? It's the way it sounds, but I think not really. What Jesus is actually trying to do is he's trying to take us deeper into God's intention behind this commandment. In creation, God brought order to chaos. And God's intention for human beings is that we are to live together uh, in, in, in peace, in community, and in mutuality with one another. And strong feelings like anger can make that very difficult for us to maintain. When anger erupts out of our control and becomes rage, it very often leads to actions that can't be taken back, that nothing can make right. No words, no actions can, can bring peace in situations like that. Uh, what happened in Memphis, Tennessee a month ago is evidence of this if we needed any. And you know the story by now. There was a, a traffic stop in Memphis and police became enraged for reasons that are still unclear, I think, to everybody. And they beat the driver of that car to within an inch of his life. And he died in the hospital three day days later from the injuries he sustained. That was Tyree Nichols. You see, nothing is going to be able to make that right. No apology, no action on the part of authorities, no verdict in the trial trials that will happen uh, when those officers are put on trial, no result is going to be able to make that right. And so as human beings, it is Jesus' expectation that we will try to manage these strong feelings of ours that, that sometimes 
go outside of our control so that we can live together in peace and order. That is God's intention. And therefore, Jesus raises the bar on his followers. It, it's not enough to refrain from killing somebody because when anger spins out of control, it sometimes leads to that kind of a result anyway. And it is part of this commandment not to murder for us to seek peace and reconciliation with one another when we have done or said something that has harmed another person. And we must also be open to forgiving those who have harmed us. Jesus says, if you're bringing your gift to the altar and you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar. First, go and make peace with your brother or sister and then come and offer your gift at the altar. Now, as a side note, our act of passing the peace in worship is based on these very words from Jesus. And not only the action itself, but the location of that act within our liturgy is based on this passage. So before we collect the offering, before we bring our tithes and offerings, our gifts to the altar on Sunday morning, we are directed to make peace with our brother or sister. And this is just not a, a, an act for worship. It is intended to be a carryover into our other relationships outside of this community. When we have hurt somebody, we are to seek peace and reconciliation with them. But then, of course, as human beings, that's very difficult for us to do because if we are, are going to seek to, to make things right with someone else, we first of all have to be willing to admit that we have committed a wrong and humble ourselves to make that admission to the person we have hurt. And that very often is, is more than we're willing to do. And it's even harder on the other end, I think, for many of us, uh, to be open to forgiving someone else who has hurt us because some injuries are really very difficult to, to, to get beyond, to move on from. I've had people in the congregations I've served over the years describe for me assaults that they have experienced at the hands of, well, very often, somebody they were supposed to be able to trust, like a father or a husband. And I've had those same people say to me, after describing the experience, I, I know that as Christians we're, we're supposed to forgive, but I just can't do it. I can't forgive him. And you know, that's honest, that's fair, and that's human. And, and very often they'll say something like, what's more, I can't imagine God ever forgiving him for what he's done. And while I think it's problematic for us to place limitations on what God can or cannot forgive, that, of course, is God's purview. It is truthful and honest to say, I can't forgive. We are human beings, and we have limitations. And yet God has set that high bar for us. It's not enough to obey the letter of the law, there is the substance of the law, there is what God intends for our relationships. And that can very often be something that is outside of our reach. In the next one, Jesus really does sound like the thought police. He says, you have heard it said that you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you, that when anyone looks lustfully at a woman, he has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Once again, adultery is probably for most of us an achievable commandment. Not committing adultery, that is. Uh, the majority of us here who have been married 
have probably been able to resist that impulse, that temptation, uh, and, and have not actually carried out the act. Whatever temptations we may have faced, whatever um, compromising situations we may have found ourselves in over the years, we have been able to resist succumbing to that inclination. But not even to think about it, that is beyond our capacity for most of us. I, I'll speak for myself, I can't speak for all of you. But as human beings, we're, we're sexual beings, uh, and, and, and we have those drives, we have those inclinations. But once again, I think what Jesus is up to here is he's trying to get us to understand God's intention for our relationships with, with one another as human beings. We are created in God's image, which means that we are full and complete human beings. We have personality, we have identity, we have talents and abilities, we have a purpose for our lives, and we have dignity. We are more than the sum of our body parts. We are, are more than just eye candy for somebody else's pleasure. We have the right to be regarded as more than an object for somebody else's lurid fantasies. And of course, once we get to know someone, we know them as a full human being, as a complete and whole person. It becomes very difficult for us to treat that person as merely an object. And yet, we're human beings. We have inclinations and drives and impulses. Some of them are very powerful and compelling and difficult for us to control. And so once again, I think Jesus is setting a bar for us that we, that we just can't quite reach. Whatever our desires and our, our will, our, our desire to please God, we are never going to be able to climb to those heights. And so the question is, where's the good news in any of this? I said that Jesus sounds like a Lutheran in these teachings. Jesus is the only one who was ever able to keep God's law and all of God's commandments completely and fully. As he says to us last week in the Gospel reading, I came not to abolish the law or the prophets, but to fulfill. Folks, he came to do that for us. You and I may not be murderers, but our track record on some of the other commandments probably isn't so good. How many of us can say that we have loved God first and foremost and fully and completely at all times? Most of you have probably never stolen something outright from somebody else, but how many of us here have at one time or another sold something knowingly to someone else for more than it was worth. Like a car or a home. And you might think, well, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. That's not against the law. But as Jesus demonstrates in his teachings today, to, to, to abide by the letter of the law is not enough very often. God expects more for us. And Luther, in his commentary on the Ten Commandments tells us that we also have a duty not to defraud another person. Coveting is another one. Every time we decide we just have to have something because it's the shiniest and the newest, we violate that commandment, particularly if we go into debt to do it. So. As much as we try, as hard as we try, whatever our determination might be, we are always going to come up short. And believe it or not, in that is good news. Because Jesus achieved 
the righteousness that God calls for. He is our righteousness. On the cross, he poured out his righteousness for us, his love and his mercy and his grace, along with his innocent blood. And he makes us right again with God. He brings peace between God and us and makes it possible for us to make peace with one another. And that is why I say that Jesus, while not being a Lutheran, has given us a very Lutheran sermon this morning.